thank you to uh, to you to service measurement system um, for the possibility to join the workshop as a uh, co-organizer um yeah and first of all i want to um, give you an, a short um, presentation about the institute and um, of the department of for lightweight engineering and um, surface functionalization um yeah our name is uh, really long. It's uh, Saxony um, Textile Research Institute, um, shortened STFI. Um, we are located. Oh, wait. We are located in Saxony, um, in Chemnitz, especially. It's between um, Leipzig and Dresden in the eastern part of Germany, um, and the former European capital of culture in 2025. I hope you all visit, will visit Chemnitz. Uh, it will be. Georgia, uh, really great. So what we are, we are an innovation partner and service provider for our customers. Um, we collaborate with a lot of association institutes, small and medium sized and also big companies. Um, we try to support them in their research um, activities. Um, yeah, and that's our field um, where we are working um, quite um, near to the industry. Um, some data about the Institute. We was founded in 1992 as a consolidation of two um, institutes of the GDR. Um, per uh, year, we are working on about 100 or 120 uh, national research projects. That's our main task. We are also involved in um, European projects. Um, yeah, and at the moment we are more than uh, 153 employees, we're nearly 160. That's uh, quite a lot. And um, we do test and certification for companies worldwide. Yeah, what our, our main field, research and development, as I told you, um, we also do testing and certification um, for textile structures. Um, Perhaps you know Ecotex, um, everybody wearing it. It's about um, some mat um, to detect um, uh, materials in your clothing and so on. We also do testing for um, personal protection clothing and so on. We have our own trainee projects and one big part is also the transfer of the results um, to the partners to um, get as much of effort from the results we uh, generated in the research projects. Yeah, we, uh, com we nearly completely cover the whole textile chain. We start with the fiber. We are not a fiber manufacturer. We have a lot of um, cooperation with um, fiber production um, industries. Um, we can go to the yarn. We have our own spinning field. Um, then we go to the surface. Um, we have weaving and knitting technologies in the house. Um, we have possibilities to functionalize um, the surface. That's what my colleague later will talk on. And we go to the semi finished product or the textile product in the application. And that's where we um, try to. Um, support um, the industry or the companies um, which we are working with. So our main competence fields are the center of lightweight construction. That's where I'm working. Um, one main field is the carbon fiber recycling. We are working with uh, pyrolytic or solvolytic fibers, which um, are gained um, from the earlier product. Um, we can manufacture them by non-woven technologies um, to a new semi-finished products. Um, another um, competence center um, is the center for non-woven technologies. We can um, work with fibers, uh, from the fiber to the non-woven. We can do extra extrusion non-wovens. And um, one big part there is the textile recycling. Um, especially at the moment, um, the recycling of smart materials or smart textiles, um, what is um, getting much bigger now. Yeah, um, these non-wovens, the extrusion non-wovens, for example, are made for masks at the moment. We um, have a quite big um, plant to um, produce um, masks and uh, or materials for masks. And that's at the moment one big topic, you know, 
Um, and um, the other innovation center is um, for tex uh, technical textiles. Um, there are the um, technologies for weaving and knitting and also for reinforced structure, also geotextiles and so on, smart textiles, um, and also the department for functionalization and chemical analysis. So um, short um, some information about the center of lightweight engineering. Um, what we do, we do it since 2006, um, uh, the recycling um, of carbon fibers back to um, composite materials. We have a non-woven production line from Auteva in Nomako in our house. We can work on a width of um, one meter. Um, we can produce non-wovens um, based on synth um, synthetic or uh, glass or natural fibers. Um, it depends on what the customer needs. We can do uh, blends with thermoplastic materials or other materials. That's also possible. Um, and for these um, non-woven materials, we have um, two technologies in-house, um, the Yearley and the Cardic system, um, where we can, can influence the fiber orientation with both technologies in, in some way. Um, yeah, that's it. We can also go to the sliver and yarn. Um, that's a project, um, I think, two or three years ago, um, which gained also or wins um, innovation prize. Um, it's um, some kind of secondary roving material which can be used in the textile chain. Um, so we do the recycling to non-wovens um, and I told we go back to composite. If we do mixtures with thermoplastic um, fibers and carbon fibers or glass fibers and so on, um, everything is possible. Um, we have um, different kind of press technologies in our house. We, um, we have um, discontinuous um, compression systems like um, a downstroke or different downstroke presses. Um, we can do injection methods like um, RTM and um, vacuum infusion. Um, but we also have since three years um, a continuous compression molding system where we can produce um, they are called um, organo sheets um, on a continuous way. Um, yeah. And we do the testing of the materials, um, classic composite testing um, like tensile test and uh, bending test, interlaminar shear strength. Um, but we also um, investigate in or do the testing for the fibers or the roving materials um, according to fineness and tenacity. Um, and also um, the roughness of the fibers. Yeah, um, one result of a project, what I uh, show often is um, what's the possibility of the non-woven materials we gain from the recycling materials uh, or the recycling carbon fibers. Um, we do these sheets and repress them to laminates. And um, at the moment, we are a bit above uh, glass fabrics. And we want to increase at this level um, of the properties much more to fill the gap between, between endless glass and endless carbon fibers. Yeah. And now um, it's part for, or it's time for Mr. Siegel. I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, now it's working. So I was not able to, to switch me on, so uh, so the administrator has done this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Frank Siegel. So I am the head of the Department of Functionalization and Chemical Analytics. Uh, today, more in the part of uh, functionalization, surface functionalization. And uh, so, uh, Christopher, please make the next slide. So, uh, what we do, uh, we are living in houses. No, it's fun. Uh, just kidding. So, uh, normally we are working in a, a span of different um, typical questions in research and everything is, um, let's say, uh, uh, it's getting to get getting together. So, of course, we have a lot of material issues and also uh, approaches and methods how to manufacture it. 
and that's why we have uh, here the, the the alignment there to work together with material and methods and of course we have always uh, in behind the um, yeah, uh, the reason uh, of ecology and env environmental protection. Uh, if we do surface functionalization, and of course we have the part of textile chemical analysis. And in the best case, uh, if everything works well together, we have at the end uh, a product, a running process, and of course innovation. Okay, next slide. Um, the classic textile finishing processes we uh, have here in the uh, in our institute. Uh, just to have a short offer, overview, of course, it's uh, yeah we have mechanical thermal processes there. We have thermal processes, and uh, in our case, uh, why it's interesting here to 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 speak about the. Uh, uh, characterization uh, of surfaces, uh, the chemical and physical processes. Uh, that means we do impregnations, we do spraying, we do coating, printing, and laminating to, uh, yeah, to functionalize textile surfaces. Next slide. Just to give you a short hint, what we do uh, with, um, yeah different novel um, methods of manufacturing. So in this case, uh, we are speaking about digital coating methods on textile. That means, uh, yeah, inkjet printing, wolfjet printing, uh, also spray on demand or 3D printing methods we, we apply. And of course, we are uh, also looking for uh, yeah, uh, different curing methods, not only temperature curing, also UV curing is interesting for us. And we also use uh, different laser technologies to pre-treat and also to cut textiles. Next slide. Um, also a big topic is for us the material characterization. That means uh, we need or we have the need to characterize uh, have, uh, inks, fluids, pastes, and of course uh, surfaces of textiles. That's why we have the ability to do uh, uh, rheological measurements uh, to yeah, see the flow behavior of pastes or uh, fluids. Uh, we are able to measure the dynamic surface tension with a bubble pressure tensiometer. And we also have the ability to do contact ankle measurements onto the textiles. Uh, another thing is uh, to have a look more onto the printing part of the digital printing part. We are able to do a droplet characterization uh, with an inkjet printhead and uh, yeah, and the system from Jet Expert uh, to characterize the droplets by size, volume, velocity, angle, and so on. Okay, next. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is there. So that's why it's interesting for us um, to have a look onto uh, other technologies to characterize. Um, Surfaces. That's my point. <laughs> yeah, short ten minutes. That's uh, the range we were given. Well, uh, thank you, the thank you, Christopher, and thank you, Frank. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you to you both. And um, of course, we anyone uh, any of our attendees who would like to find out more about STFI or who would like to uh to kind of place a query with them and hear more from them but you can go to www.stfi.de or you can email them at stfi at stfi.de so please do do that uh, now moving on to our workshop presentation for the day and as discussed previously uh this the title of today's workshop is understanding the surface properties of fibers and their use in composites by inverse gas chromatography 
Uh, our speaker for today, who will be presenting on today's topic, is Dr. Sabia Ahmed of Surface Measurement Systems. She is our application scientist for DVS and our IDC SEA instrument. Sabia has a master's degree in pharmaceutical chemistry at the Queen Mary University of London and a PhD in chemical engineering at the Imperial College London. After gaining her PhD, she started working for surface measurement systems as an application scientist on both our absorption, absorption systems and on our DVS and ITC instruments. So I will now pass over to Sabia and I would like to remind everyone that we will be stopping to take questions at the end of each application discussion. So, uh, so please do submit your questions as they come up throughout the presentation. Thank you. So in today's presentation, um, I'm going to give um, an overview of the inverse gas chromatography surface energy analyzer. So I'm going to go through um, what the system looks like and what it does. Uh, and then I'll be going through um, some um, case studies, hopefully relating to a few materials that you have. I'm going to go through a variety of different materials that we've used the IGC SEA um, for. Um, and uh, like John mentioned, um, after each um, application, um, I will stop and hopefully if you have any questions, please do ask. So, Inverse gas chromatography uh, was first developed in the 1950s. It used uh, gas vapor probes uh, as molecules to understand uh, a material. In 2009, a surface measurement system developed an IGC SEA. This is a surface energy analyzer. So this was specifically designed to determine surface energy, heterogeneity, and also because of this uh, interrelated properties, we can also understand um, things like absorption isotherms, heat absorption, uh, and so on. So compared to the typical analytical gas chromatography, you usually have a mixture of gas molecules uh, injected into uh, a known column. And upon the separation and interaction between the column material and the gas molecules, what you would have is a separation of these probes. And as a result, um, each uh, probe will elute out and you will obtain a different retention time. However, in our case, in inverse gas chromatography, we're actually packing the column with the sample of interest. So that's your sample material. And then we will inject a, a few known probes. We typically will inject um, a few alkanes uh, and a few uh, non-polar probes and a few polar probes as well. And upon the interaction between your sample and these probe molecules, we would then obtain uh, different peaks based on different retention times. And we can go ahead and analyze these peaks. <clears throat> so this is what the typical IGC SCA system looks like. It has two drawers on either side and a door in the middle. And each drawer opens up to accommodate six reservoirs. So this is where your solvent material will go. So you have six on either side, typically, um, like I mentioned, for some polar probes and some non-polar probes. The carrier gas in the system is either helium or nitrogen. And when you open the door in the middle, uh, you will see uh, places to put your column. So here we have two column positions, so one and two, and this is surrounded by a column oven. And the column oven can go from 20 degrees to 150 degrees. We're also able to understand uh, the effect of humidity on your samples. So in this case, we have a background humidity controller. And if this was the case that you wanted to understand this parameter, then we would uh, change one of our solvents uh, in, uh, in the drawers to water. We use an FID, which is a flame ionization detector, and this accurately uh, measures the concentration of uh, organic material. We also have at the panel at the front a few safety features. So the FID uh, needs uh, hydrogen to uh, ignite the FID. Uh, so we have safety features for that. And we also have an organic vapor leak detector too. And here at the bottom, um, we've got a few examples of uh, uh, materials that we can uh, analyze using the IGC SEA. So we have carbon fiber, cotton, hair, granules, uh, powders, and medical implants. 
And effectively, if we can fit them into a column, we can happily uh, run them in our system. So this is um, what a typical IGC SEA column looks like. It's relatively straightforward to pack compared to the standard GC column. We have a uh, silenized glass tubes. And uh, what you would firstly do is insert some silenized glass wall. You would then funnel in your material of interest and then close off with some more silenized glass. So this just ensures that no material is going into the system during the experiment. We also have a nice YouTube clip to kind of show um, how a simple, it, and simple, simple and straightforward it is to pack a column. So our columns come in different uh, sizes. So we have two millimeter, three millimeter, four millimeter, and 10 millimeter. Our two millimeter um, column is used for very fine particles. Um, slightly bigger powders, we would use uh, three mill millimeter columns. And the four millimeter columns uh, is typically used for fibrous materials. The 10 millimeter column um, you would use for uh, materials that you, are, are quite larger materials. So let's say a tablet or a block of wood that you wouldn't wish to kind of break up. Uh, we can place it into a 10 millimeter column. Uh, and if you were to go for this, uh, then we would uh, just need to accommodate for a slightly larger um, column oven. Alternatively, um, if you have some material, um, some quite viscous material, what we can then go ahead to and do is prepare in the, into the column in a different way. So for more uh, kind of liquid materials, what you would first do is put some silenized beads. So you would take your sample uh, outside of the column and you will coat your sample uh, with the silenized glass beads and then you would place into your uh, column. So in just ensuring that each, that all the beads are kind of evenly uh, distributed with your sample material. And again, uh, plugging in with some silenized glass wall at the bottom uh, and at the top, just to ensure that none of the material would go into the system. And in this case, because of uh, the liquid nature of the sample, it's best to run experiments uh, at room temperature just to ensure that there's no leakage of the column. So typically for an IGC experiment, the first thing you would do is pack the column of the sample of interest. We would then uh, go to the IGCSE system and choose some pro uh, probe molecules. So we choose a few non-polar solvents, and this will give rise to the dispersive interactions, and also some polar solvents, and this will give rise to the specific interactions. And using the software, we would then choose how to inject uh, these uh, probe molecules. So we can inject them in very small concentrations, infinite dilution, or larger concentrations. We then start the experiment, and depending on the interaction between the probe molecule and your sample, we would obtain different retention times. We can analyze these retention times and understand the physical chemical uh, properties. So uh, there's a, a, few, a variety of different probes we can use in the IGCSEA. So here is um, a few standards that come with the system. So we can see a variety of both polar probes and non-polar probes. Um, but if you did want to um, add your own um, solvent in there, something that uh, you, you would particularly want to do the interaction of, then it's pretty straightforward to calibrate onto the system. You would need um, a few um, essential uh, properties uh, uh, known for the probe molecule, and you can then calibrate onto the system. So the system comes with two different softwares. You have a control software, which is directly linked to the IGC SCA system. And this is where you would do your method development and start your experiments. We also have an advanced, uh, sorry, a, an analysis software. And this is where, um, after the experiment is finished, you would then analyze the raw data, uh, and then you can um, uh, understand the different properties of your sample, and we can analyze based on these uh, properties here. So to analyze uh, the data is relatively quite straightforward. You would first have um, a panel here, which is basically telling you 
the uh, solvents that you've injected and the concentrations that you've injected it uh, at. We also do some methane injections um, prior to uh, and uh, at the end of each experiment to calculate dead volume. So in relation to this, you will um, obtain a peak based on different retention times, based on di the different probe molecules. And simply what you would do is select the beginning and the end of the peak and click calculate. And what this does is it automatically calculates these parameters here. You can also um, export some raw data. So if you wish to kind of go back and uh, do some calculations yourself, that's also possible as well. IDCSCA has um, ex excellent re reliability and reproducibility of our experiments. Uh, this uh, is just showing a quick example here uh, of uh, paracetamol. And we have done uh, a BET experiment in this case, and we've done 10 uh, consecutive runs and uh, we've calculated the mean value. And as you can see, um, we have excellent reproducibility uh, and reliability of the results. We also uh, have uh, excellent reproducibility in terms of instrument to instrument. So if you're using uh, two different instruments with the same sample, um, we have excellent reproducibility between those two systems. Also from experiment to experiment, and column to column. So if you wish to pack completely two um, different, uh, same sample, two different columns, uh, we also have excellent reproducibility in that aspect too. So there's a few benefits of using the IDC SCA. First is the two column position, uh, and uh, this can offer um, two different samples to be uh, measured um, sequentially, so one after another. There's no need for any outgassing facilities. So in the case where you have, um, it's necessary to do some column conditioning, we can actually offer um, a column conditioning prior to any experiments um, uh, in the system. We have a relatively quite straightforward packing procedure. Um, and also because we are injecting in the vapor phase and not the liquid phase, uh, we are able to accurately uh, and precisely measure the exact concentrations of what's being injected. Our injections are all automatic, and uh, like I showed you, we have excellent reproducibility throughout our um, experiments. So there's a, a few different properties that can be measured by IGCSA. Uh, the most um, common is the surface energy. Uh, because we are also introducing uh, polio probes, we can also understand the acid-base interactions. Um, we can also calculate the BT specific surface area of the material. We can also understand uh, properties such as sorption isotherms, uh, permeability, diffusion, work of adhesion, cohesion. And because we are able to inject different concentrations of our vapor phase probe, we can um, obtain a heterogeneity map across the surface of our samples. We also have an additional feature, uh, and this is called a film cell. And for the film cell, um, it analyzes more planar materials. So in this example, we've got a sheet of paper here. And in this case, we don't necessarily want to um, um, strip up the sample and place it into the column. So we want to put it into a film cell. So this film cell um, has a panel here where you place your sample. And these lines here are directly linked to the IGC SEA system. And this film cell sits beside the IGC SEA. And in this case, you will have a full uh, background humidity control, but not necessarily the, temp the temperature control um, because it's not surrounded by an oven. So, what is surface energy? So, surface energy is one of the most commonly measured properties of the IGC SEA. It's analogous to the surface tension of liquid, and we want to understand the ability of the surface to react compared uh, to the bulk. And in this case, to measure surface energy, we need two different components. We need a dispersive component, and this is the form of um, nonpolar probes, and this is to understand the long range uh, physical interactions. We also need a, a Lewis acid base component. In this case, we want to understand the short range chemical interactions. 
So prior to doing a surface energy experiments, there's a few things we need to know first. First is the uh, BT surface area of the sample. So in this case, uh, the IDC SCA is able to actually um, calculate and determine the specific BT surface area. However, if you do know the BT surface area and you've uh, used it, uh, calculated it using uh, alternative um, techniques, then we can use that as well. We also need to uh, know the molecular size of the probes. So in the case of the IGC SCA, we have a library of different um, probe molecules. And what we have is the um, physical properties as well. Um, so this is all stored on the database. So once we know these, uh, these two here, what the IGC SCA does, it calculates the amount of material you need to obtain a certain coverage across the surface of your sample. This is how we carry out our experiments. And once we do this, uh, we start the experiment and based on the interaction between the probe molecule and your material, we'll obtain different retention times and volumes, which we can then go ahead and analyze. Surface energy um, is an interesting property because it can be related to other different types uh, of properties. With increasing surface energy, we can also get an increase of wettability. We also get an increase of work of cohesion. This is how likely your sample material is to interact with itself. Uh, and this can lead to things like aggregation and flow, different flow properties. Because we can inject at multiple concentrations, we can actually uh, analyze the surface heterogeneity or homogeneity on the surface. And we can also uh, calculate the work of adhesion. This is uh, between two uh, unlike materials. So if we have sample A and sample B, we could actually calculate the work of adhesion between uh, these two samples. So like I mentioned, we can do a BET determination uh, using our system. So with typical nitrogen absorption technique, we can uh, calculate um, and determine the BT's uh, surface area uh, from about one meter squared per gram to uh, uh, 1,400 meters squared per gram. The at surface measurement systems, we have two, two, two absorption instruments. One is the DVS and one is the IGC. The DVS can also um, cover a similar range, but going just lower than one meter squared per gram and as high as 1,400 meters squared per gram. The IGC SCA um, can actually na um, focus on a lower range, so from 0.1 meters squared per gram to 100 meters squared per gram. And this entails um, uh, materials such as drugs, excipients, minerals, uh, and fibers. The benefits of using uh, both the IGC and the DVS system compared to the nitrogen absorption is firstly the temperature. So with nitrogen absorption technique, you need a very low temperature to analyze the material. Uh, and in this case, we may actually be causing some defects in our material, uh, which is maybe given an overestimation of BT as surface area. However, in our systems, we can carry out these experiments at room temperature or even higher temperatures, depending on how uh, you're actually using your sample. Uh, with the nitrogen absorption technique, you're only limit, limited to using nitrogen or even krypton. Uh, however, in the uh, DVS and IGC, we can use all, a range of organic vapors. With the nitrogen absorption technique, uh, it's, it's, you need to carry out the experiment under vacuum. But with the DVS and IGC, we can carry out uh, um, uh, ambient pressures. And in the case of the DVS, we also have a DVS vacuum which uh, can also accommodate um, carrying out the experiments uh, under vacuum as well. So uh, before I go on to uh, some case studies, um, I just wanted to ask if anyone had any questions just regarding to operation of the system. So feel free to um, type in um, your questions using the chat box, um, but I will be um, stopping uh, here and there. So um, 
Yeah, please do write your questions in the chat or alternatively, uh, I will be taking questions at the end as well. So just moving on, um, this uh, example is looking at how we uh, calculate the BET specific surface area. So in this case, we have a, a standard reference material, CRM 170. This is an aluminium material. And uh, in this case, we have um, our sample of 500 milligrams. We have our temperature of um, experimental temperature of 30 degrees. And we preconditioned at 100 degrees for six hours. In this example, we've used octane as our probe molecule. And we've obtained uh, the resulting isotherm here. So what we do is apply the BET um, equation. Uh, and when you apply the BET equation, you come up with a BET plot. So in this case, what we really wanted to do is actually compare the uh, volumetric technique compared to our chromatographic technique and see how the results vary. Um, and in this case, what we can understand is compared to uh, the nitrogen absorption technique, which actually have very similar um, values. So they're very comparable uh, with each other. Um, also, um, just uh, another example here with CRM 171. And again, we actually wanted to see how comparable it is to uh, the volumetric technique. So like I mentioned, we uh, can also apply relative humidity uh, on the surface uh, of the material. So in this case, we're calculating the BT of the material and increasing relative humidity. So we start off with 0% RH uh, and giving about uh, 2.95 meters squared per gram. So as we increase relative humidity, what we can actually see is a trend of a decrease of BT specific surface area. So what this is telling us is that as uh, what this is telling us is that when we introduce humidity, we're actually introducing water molecules onto our surface. So when we inject our probe molecule, so in this case octane, the octane is actually computing for these sites. In this case, we have a limited kind of surface area of the material for octane. So as a result, we have uh, very less uh, a lower BT surface area as we increase relative humidity. We also have some papers um, comparing the volumetric technique to our chromatographic technique. And <clears throat> in, the, in the case of kind of spread, spray dried uh, material, we've actually they actually kind of compared the two techniques and found that because of the harsh conditions of using uh, the volumetric uh, technique, and in this case using krypton, you're actually uh, causing more damage to the material um, at these conditions. And when we calculate the BT surface area, we're not really getting a more representative value of how we're actually using uh, our material. So is there any questions on um, calculating uh, BET? Hi, Sabia. We haven't seen any come in yet. But uh, just to remind the audience, you can submit these questions either through the chat window or through the questions panel on your right. So please do submit any questions you have as we go along in the presentation. Thanks, John. OK. So uh, in this case, I'm going to move on to um, a different case study. So in this case, we're looking at um, D-mannitol. And we want to use the IGC SCA to understand uh, the heterogeneity uh, of two samples. So we have the D-mannitol and we have a silenized D-mannitol. So when we carry out the, our experiments using the IGC SCA, this is uh, one of the results that we have. So this is looking at the dispersive surface energy. So we're looking, uh, focusing on our non-polar uh, probe molecules. And on the x-axis, we have surface coverage. So this is uh, the injections that we've, um, the concentrations that we've injected our probe molecules at. So we see two different pr uh, profiles here. For our cyanide demanitol, we see uh, quite a linear profile. And our um, 
untreated demanitol, we see a uh, more curved profile. So first of all, the what we can see is that uh, our cyanide demanitol has a lower dispersive surface energy than our untreated demanitol. And the curved nature and the linear nature is actually suggesting uh, how homogeneous or heterogeneous our surface of the material is. So what it's telling us is the more linear the profile, the more homogeneous, and the more curved the profile, the more heterogeneous. And the difference is particularly in the infinite dilution region here. So injecting small concentrations. So what we're actually doing at these small concentrations, specifically in the untreated demanitol, we're actually um, accessing higher surface uh, uh, surface energy sites. So these red molecules can interact with these sites, and as a result, we have a higher dispersive surface energy. And as you increase uh, the concentration, you actually get gradually getting a plateau out of a more uh, stable uh, surface energy. What we can also do is uh, plot this in a different way. So we can take a point by point uh, integration uh, uh, of the data points here and plot to obtain the uh, dispersive uh, surface energy distribution. What this is telling you is the broadness and the narrow narrowness of each peak. So the more broad the peak, the more um, uh, heterogeneous the surface of the sample, and the more narrower the peak, the more homogeneous uh, the material of the sample. So um, that was just like a, uh, a brief kind of uh, example of how to kind of analyze uh, what we would actually obtain from the IGC SCA. So we're going to go uh, into a different case study now. So this is the surface energy heterogeneity of uh, carbon fibers. So in this case, we have uh, carbon fibers from Hexcel. We are treating, uh, have a few surface treatments. We have sized and unsized. And because the IDC offers um, column conditioning, we've actually pre-treated the column uh, and the sample, one at 30 degrees and one at 120 degrees. So we wanted to use IDC SCA to uh, measure the differences in the size and unsize, as well as the pretreatment conditions. So this is the results here. So we have dispersive surface energy uh, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have surface coverage. So what we can understand here, if we see both our sized material at the bottom, we can understand that this uh, has a lower surface energy compared to our unsized material. And what we can also see that this is much more linear. This is suggesting a more homogeneous surface compared to our unsized material, which is showing a more um, a heterogeneous surface. And again, if we look at infinite dilution region, we are seeing that the unsized material has high surface energy sites which can uh, be accessed uh, by using a small concentration of our probe molecule. So again, taking a point by point uh, integration, uh, we can obtain a dispersive surface energy distribution. So again, the more wider the peak, the more heterogeneous surface sample, and the more narrower peak, the more homogeneous surface of the sample. And in this case, if we have a look at the temperature differences, we can see that at 120 degrees, when the sample is uh, conditioned, that we're actually um, accessing uh, actually more uh, heterogeneous surface. So what this is telling us is that at 120 degrees, we're actually removing, uh, maybe removing or making more higher surface energy sites more accessible. Uh, and at 30 degrees, you don't have enough energy input into the system to actually release any of these um, contaminants that may kind of occlude high surface energy uh, high energy sites. So in this case, um, increasing the temperature to 120 actually uh, will uh, give rise to more higher energy sites, and which can be reflected by uh, the IGC results here. So um, using these materials, uh, we also have an oxidized. Um, uh, material, we've also treated it 
uh, oxidized with epoxy agents, and we have an unoxidized and unsized material. So in this experiment, uh, we've oxidized uh, some materials and kept a few um, as they are, and we want to understand um, um, the um, acid-base properties of this material. So uh, because we are injecting uh, acidic and basic, basic components uh, during the experiment, uh, what we can uh, understand is the Ka and Kb uh, of our material. And um, compared to uh, the, uh, with regards to our oxidized uh, species, these uh, of course have a higher Ka value, which you can see here, compared to our untreated material. So it gives us a good indication of um, whether this uh, oxid oxidization uh, surface treatment has uh, occurred and to what extent. So again, any questions at all uh, regarding the case study so far? So I'm going to- uh, have, Oh, sorry, um, Samia. We yeah. have a question here from uh, Ava Mees. They ask, how long does it take to run a typical experiment to get a heterogeneity plot? plot? For example, in the case of carbon fiber study that you presented. Okay, sure. So. Um, experimental time depends on a few things. Uh, firstly, on how many uh, probe molecules you're using. So uh, in this case, typically we would try to use uh, around three or four uh, non-polar molecules. So we're looking at uh, maybe from hexane all the way uh, to undercane. And from this selection, we can uh, choose three um, probe molecules. And once you've chosen these molecules, we then can have the option of uh, what uh, concentrations we wish to inject at. So that's um, typically we would uh, want to at least reach about 20% uh, or uh, uh, of, the, of the surface of the material, because as you can see, we do get a plateau eventually. So increasing the uh, concentrations will only uh, give you so much information. So in this case, uh, we can typically um, have probably about uh, 10 injections for each of our polar probes, uh, sorry, each of our non-polar probes. Um, so yeah, so we would have, it depend, depends on uh, what kind of probe molecules you choose and the amount of injections that you want. Uh, and again, it also depends on the um, retention time and of your uh, molecule. So, Typically, lower alkenes will elute out quite quickly, and higher alkenes will elute out a lot later. So if you're, let's say you've injected hexane and it elutes out within six minutes, um, you would typically just have about uh, six or seven minutes um, for your uh, runtime for each injection. So it does depend on a few different variables, um, all depending on what kind of probe molecules you use, uh, the concentrations you wish to inject, and the interaction between the molecule and your material. So I hope that answers your question. I think it does. Thank you, Sevilla. Uh, that's all the questions we have for the last section. Lovely. Oh, wait, actually, no, one has just come in. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just missed that. Um, Frank Siegel asks, um, at the plot points, only the dispersive surface energy is shown. Uh, I guess for the polar part, the experiment should be done again with another process gas. Is it possible to do it directly afterwards? And what is the process? Yes, exactly. So um, this uh, you would use it in the same experiment. So if I just scroll all the way to the beginning. So here, uh, for each method, um, we've actually shown an injection of uh, a non-polar probe at a specific concentration. So you would typically have, you would just carry on injecting your um, probe, probe molecules. So after you've uh, chosen your dispersive components and your alkanes, you would then go ahead in the same method, introduce your polar components in the exact same way. 
So you wouldn't have to, so it's just all one experiment. So you wouldn't have two separate experiments. You would just have them all in one experiment. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, that's the that's our last question for that previous section. So uh, yeah, I think we can move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this example, we're looking at the BET surface area of fibers. So um, with the slide that I'm going to show, we do have um, a paper uh, discussing uh, in more detail the uh, experimental. Uh, procedures uh, and um, also the results. So in this case we're looking at um, comparing a few different fibers. So uh, we have uh, cellulose fibers, uh, a biomed fiber, uh, and this is uh, processed um, by dry uh, jet wet spinning process. We also have uh, natural fibers so these are two blast fibers. So this is a, a knaf fiber and a flax fiber. And here at the bottom are the uh, SCM images for each of the fibers. So as you can see already, you, just looking at the SCM images, um, we can see that our processed fibers are uh, much more thinner, much more uniform compared to our natural fibers. Uh, which of course will have some variation uh, and uh, as a result uh, a few um, uh, a bit of heterogeneity on the surface of the samples. So what we've done is calculated uh, the BT specific surface area because we, we were interested in understanding the surface um, uh, how the BT surface area how the heterogeneity of the fibers is affected by BT surface area. So we've carried out uh, three runs uh, and carried out uh, uh, calculated a mean value uh, for each of them, and we have a very good um, stand uh, stand deviation. So what we can actually understand from this is that if we look at the standard deviation of uh, the BT of our material, we can see that our biomid and our kina uh, fibers have similar surface, er um, surface areas, and the flax fibers have a, a more higher surface area. We can also see how uh, standard deviation varies. So we can see that for our process fiber, we have very small uh, standard deviation, uh, and we have a relatively high standard deviation for our KNAP and our flax uh, fibers. And um, this really correlates to the variation of our natural fibers because of course they're not processed and therefore will have some uh, variation on the surface uh, of the samples. And this is directly related to the surface roughness uh, of the fibers. We've also carried out a, a batch to batch uh, variability uh, of our material. So we've actually done column to column experiments and calculate the BT uh, specific surface areas. And what we can see is that uh, our biomid uh, processed fibers have very small standard deviations and our uh, natural fibers have larger um, deviation. And this again relates to um, sampling of the natural fibers and the surface heterogeneity and the roughness uh, of uh, the material. And this is due to the the irregularities on the surface of the material. We've also carried out some surface energy experiments. Uh, and what we want to understand, uh, have a look at, is the surface heterogeneity. So this is showing you the um, dispersive and the, uh, the specific um, interactions uh, of the material and showing you the distributions. So the two natural fibers, um, if we have a look at the uh, specific surface energy, our two natural fibers uh, have a very narrow um, peak width compared um, to our, sorry, our um, natural fibers uh, have a wider um, peak width. 
than our um, processed fibers. So this is uh, showing you that there is more of a right uh, variation of heterogeneity across these fibers. Again, similarly with the dispersive uh, component as well. So the next case study is looking at the influence of leaching. Uh, and in this example, we're looking at hair samples. So we've got uh, some hair samples which were treated differently. So one is the untreated hair sample. One is using bleach for 60 minutes. One having a UV treated sample for uh, 74 hours. Uh, and pre-treatment was made for um, five hours. So we've carried out the experiments um, at 0% RH and 303 Kelvin. So the experiments that we carried out, uh, the alkanes we used uh, were from tridecane to uh, heptadecane. Um, what we could understand is firstly, by looking at the dispersive surface energy, we can see that uh, our untreated has a lower dispersive surface energy compared to our treated samples. So this is already suggesting uh, some uh, differences in uh, heterogeneity on the surface of our samples. And our untreated sample is more homogeneous. What, we, what we've also done is injected uh, a few um, specific probe molecules. So we've injected hexanol and butyl acetate. So we cho uh, choose these components based on um, their interactions between the hair samples. So we've injected them and seen how they interact with the hair samples. And as a result, um, we've uh, got the surface, uh, surface energies here. Sorry, the free energy here. Uh, so what we can see that, first of all, um, our, with regards to the butyl uh, acetate, all three of our samples interacted mostly, most strongly uh, with butyl acetate compared to our hexanol. So this is suggesting to us that there are some uh, functional groups on the surface of these materials that actually have a high affinity uh, for butyl acetate compared with hexanol. So the surface treatment has actually um, um, caused some functional groups to be exposed and therefore can interact with butyl acetate. So um, the next case study we're looking at is the evaluation of protein hydration. So in this case, we have um, some materials, polypropylene, uh, and we treated the polypropylene with a protein called uh, a zine protein, which has a high um, hydrophobic content of amino acids. So this is a um, sorry relative humidity study. We preconditioned uh, for two hours at 30 degrees and carried out uh, the experiment at 0, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 percent relative humidity. We want to understand the effect of uh, humidity. Uh, on the differences of these two samples. So in this, these results here, we're looking at the dispersive surface energy profiles, um, and these are the um, surface coverages we've obtained. So um, firstly, we can see that our polypropylene treated with our zine protein which has a lower dispersive surface energy compared to our polypropylene uh, on its own. Um, what we can also see that at higher um, surface coverages, these actually become quite similar. And the differences are mainly in the infinite dilution region. So what this is telling us is that at this region here, uh, when we inject at very small concentrations, we are actually accessing higher energy sites therefore giving such a, um, a distinct uh, curvature of the profile in regards to just polypropylene on its own. And at lower uh, coverages, the protein incorporated on, incorporated on the surface of the sample uh, actually results into a more homogeneous sample. So looking at the distribution, um, we can have a look at the peak width. So the peak width of our polypropylene is significantly quite wide compared to uh, the polypropylene with the zine uh, treated 
material. And this again is suggesting that the wider the peak, the more heterogeneous the surface of the sample. So in this example, uh, this result, we're looking at the specific surface energy. So in this case, we've used dichloromethane and ethyl acetate as probe molecules. And we can see that the polypropylene sample has a relatively higher specific uh, surface energy uh, compared to the zine protein. And again, we, ha we have the same uh, trend where incorporating the zine protein were actually causing the surface to be much more homogeneous. And therefore, we see a narrower peak width compared to polypropylene on its own. We've also done uh, calculated the Ka and Kb uh, um, of the material. And what we can see is that approaching the incorporation doesn't significantly cause a change in the surface acidity, but uh, it does reduce the basic properties. And this is looking at the electron donating functional groups uh, of the surface. So we've then um, carried out the experiments uh, using different relative humidities and calculated the polarity of the material. So if we just look at the uh, polypropylene with the zine protein incorporated, what we can see is when we increase relative humidity, we're actually increasing polarity up until about 70% RH, where it actually falls off uh, when you go up to 80% RH. Uh, and this uh, may, uh, can be correlated to maybe the uh, specific, uh, functional groups on the surface of the sample. Uh, and looking at just the polypropylene on its own, we have an increase of polarity up until about 50% RH where well, this then drops off, and then we have a bit of variation uh, when we increase humidity further. We've also calculated the surface energy uh, of the material. Uh, so we have specific dispersive and total surface energy for polypropylene and the polypropylene uh, zine um, sample. So uh, what we can see is looking at 0% RH, um, uh, we can see they look uh, quite similar. Uh, we can see that the uh, polypropylene sample doesn't uh, really show much of a change with regards to the specific surface energy upon the increase of relative humidity. Uh, what we can also see is that um, the dispersive surface energy increases um, gradually with increasing relative RH. If we look at the PPZ, um, we have um, uh, more of a variation. Um, so at, from compared to 0% RH and we increase relative humidity, we're actually seeing a drop in dispersive surface energy. Um, so this is interesting um, just to compare the different surface energies in relation to relative humidity. We've received one here, Sabia. Um, it asks, all these different parameters that you showed are calculated by your software or does the uh, or does the user just get the data of the initial peak? So yes, yeah, so um, they are all calculated using the software. Um, if I can, so if we go back to this slide, um, once you've actually calculated your data um, uh, and analysed all your peaks, uh, you actually have a few tabs here that you can go ahead and select. And so using just the same experiment you've done, just injecting polar and non-polar probes, you can actually um, calculate the KAKB isotherms, uh, BT specific surface areas, uh, work of adhesion and cohesion, um, and surface energy. So with just this experiment, we can easily just calculate um, all these parameters. Um, for other properties such as heat, heat absorption, uh, glass transition uh, temperature and solubility and so on, they require a, a different uh, method setup. So um, with the ones I've shown you in my case studies, these are as a result of just uh, one um, experiment injecting a mixture of both polar probes and non-polar probes at different concentrations. 
So the next example we're looking at is uh, looking at a polymer matrix. So in this case, we have um, a few different materials. We have carbon nanotubes. So we have uh, as received carbon nanotubes and uh, carbon nanotubes functionalized with carboxylic acids. We also have um, nanoclays uh, and we have as received nanoclays and functionalized nanoclays with uh, isocyanate. We also have a polyurethane matrix. So we want to, this is um, a work of adhesion study, so to understand the uh, dispersion and work of adhesion uh, of the materials uh, in the polyurethane matrix. So this is a result of the total surface energy uh, of the materials. Uh, and what we can see um, is different uh, surface energies of all our uh, materials that I've mentioned. Uh, and with higher surface energy, we would have a greater uh, work of cohesion. Um, so what we can see is our as received nanoclay and our uh, carbon nanotubes with carboxylic acid functional groups have relatively higher uh, total surface energies. And what this is telling us is that it will have a, a greater work of uh, cohesion and greater particle-particle interactions. And this can actually result in a uh, poor dispersion and uh, a decreased load transfer in our polyurethane uh, matrix. We've also calculated the work of adhesion uh, and cohesion uh, for each of our materials. We've also calculated the work of adhesion and cohesion ratio. So if it's too strong or too weak, the particles, uh, if we have particle-particle interactions which are too strong or too weak, it can either lead to kind of segregation inside the matrix or lead to um, uh, poor um, dispersion inside the matrix. So it's, it's a good idea to um, optimize the work of adhesion and cohesion ratio uh, to um, actually develop different formulations and give an idea of what is best to actually have a um, better dispersion in your polymer matrix. Um, what we also see is that the work of adhesion cohesion ratio uh, is highest for the uh, as received um, carbon nanotubes and our functionalized uh, nanoclay. So we've also actually correlated these results to some uh, mechanical performance um, techniques, so looking at tensile strength. Uh, and what we can understand is that uh, the two components with the highest work of adhesion to cohesion ratio actually have a higher tensile strength. So we've co correlated um, uh, the work of adhesion and cohesion with a separate technique to calculate uh, tensile strength. Uh, and this is the results here. Um, so it's a good way of kind of um, using it as a formulation technique as well um, to understand uh, the material and obtain better properties. Uh, of the material. So um, this next example, uh, we're looking at uh, polyolefins. And uh, these are uh, different uh, materials, and they have uh, low surface energies. Uh, we we're looking at a few, six different thermoplastic uh, polyolefins, so uh, TPOs, uh, with different degrees of uh, elastomer loadings. So we've got 12% and 25%. Uh, and uh, these are the samples here. So we've carried out uh, our experiment at 30 degrees, 0% uh, relative humidity, and pre-treatment for 30 degrees for about two hours. Um, so we wanted to understand the um, mat uh, material uh, adhesion. We're looking at an adhesion study and want to understand the um, adhesion of our paints uh, as a top coat on the material. So what we can see here is the dispersive surface energy uh, of all of our samples. Um, what we can uh, understand by looking at this is that for each of our samples, 
will be increased to about 20, 25%. For each of our samples, we actually have a greater dispersive surface energy. And uh, especially in the case of our 4049 sample, uh, where increasing the uh, elastomer to 25% has a significant increase in dispersive surface energy. Uh, and this could, uh, uh, as a result, correlate to uh, the higher, uh, better work of adhesion between two materials. Uh, so in this case, we've actually correlated uh, the dispersive surface energy um, and to measure the work, uh, the, uh, the, the traction for force and the measure of adhesion. Um, so as the dispersive surface energy um, increases, also so does the practical uh, work of adhesion. Uh, and this can be used kind of as a predictive tool um, to understand uh, what kind of paints in this case um, could easily be coated on the surface of the sample. So any questions on those two case studies? Thank you, Rumi. Uh, thank you, Sabir. Yes, we have a, a few questions coming in. Um, our, uh, our first asks, um, which probe analyte was used to determine the properties of the nanomaterials? Um, okay, so the probe molecules, uh, in this case, uh, again, with the dispersive surface energy, we are looking at um, a series of N-alkanes. Uh, and this can be from uh, around hexane to up until dodecane, so about C6 to about C12. Uh, and typically, you'd use um, three or four um, non-polar probes. The exact probes, uh, we have a case study uh, and an application note uh, for this particular example, uh, which we can send you. And they'll have the exact uh, probe molecules that we've used for uh, this experiment. Great, thank you. Uh, and another question we have here. Um, oh, let me just get up so I can see. Uh, they ask, um, you showed there is a range of surface energy values that we can acquire. Calculating the work of adhesion cohesion, which value did you use? Um, so work of uh, adhesion cohesion, we're looking at the um, uh, the dispersive surface energies. Uh, so in this case, um, again, I can show you the um, uh, the case study for this as well. Uh, but uh, typically, you could use uh, an average uh, of all the injections, or alternatively, you can use um, the highest, so the highest coverage for about twenty percent. And this is where uh, the dispersive or specific surface energy plateaus out uh, and this is where um, you could use this value as well. So you can use an average of all data points or you could uh, just stick to one. So again, right. uh, we do have a case study on this as well. Thank you, Sabia. Uh, that's all the questions we have for that last section, so I think we can continue. Thank you. So um, in this example, we're looking at the uh, effect of uh, the cleaning process on surface energy and heterogeneity. So in this case, we're actually using our film cell, which uh, I showed you previously, and we're inserting our sample material uh, in the planes uh, of the film cell here. Uh, so we're, the materials we're looking at are aluminium and teflon. Uh, so we need a sample area of about um, uh, about, I think about 20, uh, sorry, two inches by eight inches. Um, and we want to understand the cleaning procedures and the effect of surface energy uh, using the material. So uh, in this case study, we are looking at uh, aluminium, uh, bleached aluminium and aluminium treated with uh, nitric acid. So in this case, uh, what we can see is that the aluminium treated with nitric acid has a higher uh, dispersive surface energy compared to the aluminium and our bleached 
uh, material, which you can see are relatively quite similar to each other, which is quite interesting. Uh, looking at the heterogeneity profiles, if we look at the peak width, uh, we can also see that the nitric acid actually has a greater uh, peak width uh, compared to the other two materials. This is again suggesting a more heterogeneous um, surface and a more active surface. So in this case, the nitric acid uh, actually has treated the sample in a way where it's actually exposing or causing uh, more defects uh, on the material and as a result, uh, resulting in a more heterogeneous sample. Uh, and we can also uh, conclude that the nitric acid is much more harsher uh, compared to our uh, bleached treatment. So we've also uh, carried out the same experiments for Teflon. Uh, and what we can see here is that for our Teflon, our untreated Teflon actually uh, has higher dispersive surface energy. And um, secondly, our Teflon treated with bleach um, has uh, the next highest dispersive, dispersive surface energy, and treated with nitric acid has the lowest dispersive surface energy. Uh, looking at the uh, dispersive surface energy uh, distribution, what we can see is that our Teflon actually has a much more homogeneous um, surface, uh, correlating to a more linear line here. And our nitric acid, uh, even though it has a, small, uh, a lower dispersive surface energy, is actually uh, has uh, much more defects uh, on the surface of the sample. Um, suggesting that it's much more rough uh, than our bleached uh, Teflon. So that was one of the last uh, case studies I had to show you. Uh, and just to kind of summarize that, the SCA is a versatile uh, technique. Uh, it is sensitive to uh, gas phase uh, vapor, sorry, vapor probe molecules. Uh, we can understand a range uh, of different properties, such as BT specific surface area, um, surface heterogeneity, and we can also carry out these um, experiments on a range and variety of different samples, from powders to fibers um, and to films. Um, so I hope um, this has given you an insight of what the system can do. And here is just a small acknowledgement of, um, of the different organizations that um, we have been involved in, uh, in terms of research using the IGC SCA and who have um, used our systems for their research and uh, scientific endeavors. So thank you for listening. If you have any other questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Sabia. Uh, yes, we'll just give uh, the audience a few my, few minutes to um, submit any questions they have in the questions panel or the chat panel. So please, anyone who has any questions for Sabia on any part of her presentation, please submit them now. Hi, Sabia. We have one uh, question here from Ramiz again. They ask, for the surface energy contact angle method also used, can you please comment on what are the benefits of using IGC and if the results are comparable? So using a contact angle to uh, understand uh, surface energy, um, there's uh, a few differences. Uh, one, of course, is the liquid nature of the probe molecule. Uh, so in this case, um, we have using vapor probes is a much more accurate way of calculating the concentration of how much probe molecule you've used and for calculations. And also with the liquid probe molecule you actually have uh, can cause a, a type of wetting on the surface of the sample, uh, which can also uh, affect the results. Uh, another thing when you're using contact angle, we're actually just focusing on a localized area of uh, the surface of the material and not really getting a more representative value of surface energy. However, when you're looking at the IGC SEA, we're actually able to inject at different concentrations across the surface of the sample. So we'll have a much more representative value um, for uh, surface energy.
Great, thank you. Um, Frank Siegel asks, for the film cell, is it possible to apply textures too, because of possible uh, leakages at the sides? So, with regard to the film cell, um, if you have um, a textile material that, let's say, it's one side is coated uh, uh, with a particular modification and one side is not, we're actually focusing on this panel here. So where these lines go in, this is where your probe molecules will be injected. So you want to put the surface of interest on this panel here. Closing the uh, film cell, you do have to ensure there are O-rings on either side. So you have to ensure a very tight and firm uh, closure of um, the film cell just to ensure uh, no leakage. But if it is a porous material um, where the probe molecules can actually uh, uh, absorb through the front and the back of the material, you will um, only be limited to kind of, uh, you, you won't be able to have the kind of um, differentiation between both sides of the surface. Um, but yes, you have to ensure that it's closed very well uh, and that you can use leak detectors to kind of ensure uh, before your experiment um, that there is no leaks during the experiment as well. 